Greetings, it's very good to see you once again. Um, we got into a little bit about the various modes of European uh, colonization of the New World the last time we met. I introduced you to numerous models, and we kind of left off by saying that the English colonists were going to be the more important uh, colonists for our class. One of the primary reasons is because I'm speaking to you in the English language right now. For very obvious reasons, the English are going to come to really be the dominant group in North America. Um, but they're also going to be very different than really any model that we saw the last time we met. They're, they're much different than the Spanish. Uh, they're different than the French and the Dutch. Uh, they're very unique in a lot of ways. One reason that they are so unique is that whereas the French couldn't give land away over here in America, the English created very populous colonies in the New World. Um, what I mean by that is there are a lot of English colonists, whereas there were not a lot of French, uh, not even a lot of Dutch or Spanish. That made the English a little bit unique. The other really important aspect to keep in mind when we talk about English colonists as, a, as opposed to everybody else is that their wealth was really grown from the ground up. Think about this for just a second. What made the Spanish their money in the New World was extracting uh, resources, first precious metals, uh, later on uh, products that, uh, that, that, that grew really well here in the New World and sold really well in the European marketplace. What made the French their money was the fur trade, the Dutch commerce with the Native Americans. What's going to be unique about the English is that it's going to be cash crops. And I'll talk much more about what a cash crop is later on in this lecture. But more than anything else, I need you to understand that the English are going to be different because their empire is going to be predicated on agricultural production. That's very unique in this uh, North American context. Lastly, and probably most important of all, Whereas the Dutch ruled over their empire relatively tightly, certainly the Spanish did, the English colonies were governed over only very loosely. Uh, the most important thing that the English government, include the king in that, the most important thing that they were trying to do was to get people to come over in droves, primarily because agriculture was, was hard work and it was very labor intensive and the more the merrier as the adage goes. And so these three things are what makes the English colonization much, much different than any other group that we talked about the last time we met. Now, I want to talk just briefly about the reasons why so many English colonists were willing to come in the first place. And it really boils down to economic necessity. The Industrial Revolution really hits England before it hit, hits any other European country. Um, and that changes the English economy. And, and long story short, what it's really going to do is it's going to push a lot of people off the land that they have been farming for generations, and it's going to create a lot of unemployment. Um, simultaneously, you've got a population boom. There's more and more babies being born. And if you do the math there, uh, what you've got is the perfect storm you've got a uh, surplus in the labor market because the population continues to increase in a day and age where you no longer need the same levels of labor that you once upon a time did because the economy is changing. You've got all of these laws uh, that uh, are throwing people in jail, uh, laws that involve debtor's prison. If you failed uh, to pay your debts, you could be imprisoned for that. And uh, a lot of the industrialists thought that this was a great thing because prison labor was routinely used uh, because it was more efficient. You didn't have to pay people the same kind of wages that you uh, that you would pay somebody on the outside. So my, my point here is English colonization was really stimulated by a changing English economy, and I mean that in a relatively bad way. There are a lot of people that were simply desperate, and America seemed like a good offer, and a lot of people took advantage of that offer. It's also kind of important for you to understand um, that the English go around, or at least its first go around, with colonizing the New World did not go especially well. In 15... A4, a guy by the name of Sir Walter Raleigh is going to lead 
what really is going to be the first of the English expeditions of the New World. Raleigh's going to land off the coast of present-day North Carolina, and he and his mates will establish what comes to be known as the Roanoke Colony, the island off the coast of mainland North Carolina they called Roanoke. Now, what Raleigh decided he was going to do next is go back over to England and raise more funds and bring more people. And uh, this would take some time, of course, but he promised the people, the colonists, that is, of Roanoke, that he would, in fact, be back. Um, let's revisit the context a little bit. The, 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 the 1580s, we know that Spain's getting ready to invade England. And although it didn't go very well for the Spanish and what came to be known as the Spanish Armada, what it did is it shut down naval traffic into and out of England. My point is, Raleigh took a lot of years to get back and, and, and revisit those colonists that he dropped off. And one of the things that the colonists had found when they had made contact uh, with the islands is that the native peoples were relatively hospitable. They, they weren't hostile. They, they were more or less welcoming. And when Raleigh returned, when the English returned to Roanoke uh, years after, they called to them. Uh, they played very familiar English music uh, that certainly the colonists would have recognized them. They just didn't have any answer. Um, the reason being, the reason that historians think, is that the colonists that Raleigh dropped off in 1584 essentially melded into the Native American population. And that's probably pretty likely what ended up happening. They, quote unquote, became natives over the course of time. And what this is going to do is it's going to lead historians to, to dub Roanoke uh, the, the quote unquote lost colony, because by the time that uh, the English showed back up years later, uh, they had lost their colonists. And so Roanoke does not go especially well for the English in their first go around. Um, a few years later, in 1607, the English government, at the behest of the king, gave another investment company uh, permission to start a new settlement. Um, they're going to settle this a little bit to the north in what is going to come to be known northern and eastern Virginia. Give you a little bit of context there. And they're going to call this uh, colony Jamestown. They named it after the King of England at the time, James. There's one thing that I really want to emphasize when it comes to English colonization. It's English businessmen that are putting up the money to get these colonies going. The English government is offering up the land. I know this might sound strange to you. Certainly it sounded strange to Native Americans that uh, had thought of that as their ancestral homelands forever and ever. But when they made contact, the English government claimed that land for England. As far as the king was concerned, that was his. It was just as much his as Liverpool or Lancashire was. And so what the English government begins doing is they begin incentivizing colonization into the New World. If you come over, um, I will give you 50 acres of land. Um, where the businessmen come in is they're putting up the investment funds, the monies necessary, the capital necessary to get these settlements off the ground and make them profitable. So you can see the convergence of three forces. On the one hand, you've got the government that's providing the land, uh, incentivizing workers to come to the new world to get those settlements producing something. We're not entirely sure what just yet. And you've got businessmen that are investing heavily in the venture, and all three of these things are essential when it comes to the English colonial model. Now, in short order, Jamestown doesn't start out any better than Roanoke did. As a matter of fact, Jamestown came very close to going down the same road that Roanoke did, another lost colony. And the reason why is pretty simple. What these people that were coming over to the New World expected to find was treasure. As a matter of fact, that's what the Spanish were finding, so why not them? If you think about Virginia, you don't really typically associate it with things like gold or, you know, even fur trading. And so, as you might imagine, they didn't find any treasure. And those first few winters were very difficult and very challenging times until they get a guy in there, uh, a military man by the name of John Smith. Now, John Smith is really responsible for organizing the Jamestown settlement in a way that lent itself to longevity 
In other words, he handed out orders and he expected those orders to be fulfilled and obeyed. You there, go and, 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 and make me some roads. You there, build me a few houses. You stabilize some water supplies. Uh, you find some, some food crops that we can survive on when the winter comes. And you're starting to see the idea here. There's something else that I want you to be mindful of. And that's the fact that Jamestown probably would have failed even with Smith's leadership had the English, pr primarily at the behest of John Smith, not befriended the local Native Americans, uh, who were led by a guy, an Algonquian uh, leader by the name of Powhatan. Um, Powhatan is ultimately going to give his daughter, uh, Ocahannes, uh, a way in, in marriage to kind of solidify this English Native American relationship to a guy by the name of John Rolfe. Um, for those of you that have seen the Disney film, um, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but Disney got this a little bit wrong when it comes to its historical accuracy. Pocahontas didn't marry John Smith, she married John Rolfe. In any case, um, I'll come back to their marriage here in a second because it is actually very important. For right now, I want you to kind of put something in your notes and, and make a big deal about this because you're going to see this again on a midterm exam. One of the things that you see sprout up pretty early on in Jamestown, especially after it, it, it demonstrates that it's got some staying power, is a representative form of government. You need to understand that the people that are coming over to Jamestown, they're making their own rules, they're enforcing their own policies, they're uh, trying their own civil and criminal cases of law. It's not the people back in England. It's certainly not the king. Um, from the king's perspective, what he wants is to bring as many people over here as humanly possible, get this thing going as quickly as possible. So if you need your own government, if you want to elect your own officials, that's fine. I don't care. That's not really what I'm here to do. I'm here to make money. My point in talking to you about this is you see some version of democracy emerging in Jamestown very, very early. Um, on the exam, the midterm exam, I'm going to ask you um, to chronicle the development of American political thought. And for my money, you can actually trace much of this back to Jamestown. And we got a taste of calling our own shots, if you will, and making our own policies and enforcing those policies. Uh, to go along with this representative form of government, we also see a court system that, once again, will lend itself to American political thought. And... If you understand this, um, you'll understand that, first of all, there's approximately 150 years that come before 1776 when war breaks out between the colonists and Britain. And you'll understand that during the 1760s and early 1770s, what the English government begins to do is to really kind of pull the rug out from under these colonists' feet when it comes to, no, we, the British, are actually calling the shots. They had upset an apple cart uh, from the colonial perspective, where we were pretty much the ones in charge for years and years and years, and now you're trying to reinvent that wheel. But right now, I want to go back to this concept that I introduced you to the last time we met, and that was mercantilism. And if you recall, mercantilism is designed to keep English money in English hands. Uh, part of this is involving the English government doling out land and English investment companies uh, putting up the startup capital to get these business ventures off the ground. Um, it's an interconnection that would really be instrumental in the English model colonization, which, keep in mind, does revolve around the production of a cash crop. But that really begs the question, what kind of cash crop? The kind of cash crop that will emerge in the English colonies, at least originally, would be that of tobacco. And it was not the English that, you know, kind of discovered tobacco. This was a Native American crop. As a matter of fact, this is what Pocahontas brought with her as part of her dowry in her marriage to John Rolfe. The knowledge and the uh, process, uh, the, the, the understanding of how to successfully cultivate tobacco. And all of a sudden, people couldn't wait to get out there in the fields and start producing this stuff because this was a crop that grew very well in the Americas and it sold even better in the European marketplace. So let me make sure that you understand what we're talking about here. 
It's Spanish gold that's making Spain its money. It's French fur trading that's making the French their money. And it's tobacco, at least initially it's tobacco. That's the cash crop that's making the English their money. But none of this would have been possible w w without the institution of labor. More of that just in a minute. Getting back to this idea of American political thought, I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Cecilius Calvert. Um, Calvert was a Catholic in England, and the reason I tell you that he was a Catholic is England, by that point in time, was a great Protestant nation, and, and Catholics were, it might be a little bit too strong to say openly persecuted, but they were certainly not treated um, as first-class citizens, not always anyway. Calvert would later take the name Lord Baltimore, and like many people of his era, he would find his way to America, where he would establish what comes to be known as the Maryland Colony. Lord Baltimore envisioned Maryland as a safe haven, a refuge, a safe place for Catholics in Britain. This would be a place where you could practice your religion openly and, more importantly, without any kind of fear from interference from the state. Now, again, if you think about American political thought, this ought, this ought to sound pretty familiar. One of the elements of the First Amendment establishes this concept that we've come to call the separation of church and state, that Congress will never make a law that makes one religion or another religion the official state religion of the United States. Maryland knocks this out pretty early, re really establishes this concept pretty early. As a matter of fact, in 1648, uh, the local self-representative government, similar to Jamestown, uh, it passes a law called the Tolerance Act in 1648. And like you might imagine, what the Tolerance Act does is it establishes religious toleration in the colony of Maryland. So you begin to see some core elements of American democracy emerging very, very early in, in, in you know, American history. It's not as if the 16 or excuse me, the 1760s rolled around and we started developing this idea that we ought to be a free and independent country. Um, but back to tobacco. As I had mentioned before, you've got these three converging forces, government, labor, and, and private business that are converging to make this venture in the Americas possible. Um, I mentioned earlier that if you could come over, what the English government would offer you is 50 acres of free land. Now, number one, land was a big, big deal in the English model. This is not something that you could really get in England. It's not like you could just work really hard and get some, get some land. Second of all, in England, if you didn't have any land, it made you a pretty much nobody as far as the English government was concerned. It, it certainly was the key to mobility, social, economic, or otherwise. And lastly, this was a real opportunity to change the world around you. The idea that you could get 50 acres of free land, not only was that a big deal, but that was a real economic opportunity. But I want you to ask yourself something for a minute. What if you desperately wanted to take advantage of this idea, but you simply could not? You simply did not have the means, money or otherwise, to get yourself from point A, England, to point B, Jamestown. And the answer to that question is you would sign an indentured contract. To indenture oneself, what that meant was, as an able-bodied worker, you would agree to work for a specified period of time, typically in between four and seven years. And in that specified amount of time, you would work for, they were literally called masters, uh, but basically, these are your benefactors, the people that paid for you to come over to the new world because they want to import as much labor as possible. Why do they want to import you? Ask yourself that question. Why do they want to bring you over? They're just being really nice. The reason that they want to bring you over is really twofold. Number one, we need more labor in the new world. I mean, that's really going to be the essence, the, the bedrock of the English model to transplant labor from the old world into the new world because colonization in the English empire is based on agriculture and you need labor for agriculture. But in addition to your labor, um, they also would receive 50 additional acres of new territory. 
So if you bring your brother, um, the guy that you met at the uh, at the restaurant the, the, the night before, in addition to one of these indentured servants, if you bring all of those guys over, that's 150 acres of additional government land that's going to be turned over to you. Do the math. More hands working equals more tobacco. More access to land equals more ability to produce more tobacco. It's very cyclical when you stop and think about it. Indentured servants and what comes to be known as indentured servitude was a very, very lucrative practice for these English colonists that are bringing over these cheap workers. That's really what we're talking about here is a cheap and docile form of labor. Um, Talking just a little bit about indentured life, um, I don't want you to conflate indentured servants with slaves. Um, slaves, uh, similar to somebody like Frederick Douglass, um, were different, and you're going to find out why a little bit later here today. But I think it suffice to say that both lived a pretty not great life, okay? Um, your master, as an indentured servant, controlled pretty much every element of your life. Uh, when you would start working, when you could stop, the amounts of breaks that you could get, uh, the conditions of your labor, whether or not you could go out after a specified time, whether or not you could get married. And so you can imagine that this would lead to some fairly undesirable circumstances. Now, I'm not very much of a dates guy. But 1619 is a really important date for our class because it's in that year that Dutch slave traders are going to introduce African servants straight from the continent of Africa into the English North American Empire. Keep in mind, I'm saying servants. I'm not saying slaves because as far as the English legal system is concerned, there is no such thing as slavery as somebody like Frederick Douglass might experience slavery. In case you're curious, these African servants are forced to sign indentured contracts, and so I guess they're not really all that free to begin with, but officially they're known as indentured servants. Until about, here comes another date, 1640. It's in that year that you begin to see a transition in a lot of different aspects of life in the English colonies, a, a lot, and you'll see what I mean here in a second. But Perhaps the best way that I can explain this transition for you is to describe the life and times of John Punch. John Punch, for your notes, was an African-American indentured servant. And in 1640, he's going to team up with two white indentures, and they're going to flee from their Virginia plantation. They're going to make it as far as southern Maryland, before the authorities are going to find them, arrest them, and drag them back to Virginia. Now, when they're on trial, um, their, their, their benefactor, their master, asked the judge um, who had found them guilty, uh, he asked the judge to punish them, that these people had broken their contracts, they had broken their promises, and they needed to be punished. They deserved to be punished. The two white indentures go in front of the judge and face him, and he said, you are in breach of contract, you violated the terms and conditions of your contract, and therefore you need to be punished. Your punishment is two additional years of servitude. You thought that you'd be graduating, so to speak, next year? Newsflash, I'm slapping two more years on to that graduation date. When John Punch goes in front of the judge, keep in mind, he's the only African-American to go in front. Um... His sentence is infinitely, infinitely worse. The judge sentences him to servitude for life. Now, understand a couple things. There was nothing in the legal codes that obliged this judge to do that. He simply did it. And the second thing that's probably worth noting is that the reason that 1640, in the case of John Punch, is such an important transitionary point, turning point, in English North American colonization is because increasingly the conditions of labor would be based on race. Um, before 1640, you had white indentured servants and you had black indentured servants. After 1640, there are more than just John Punches running around, if you follow me. There are numerous examples of people of African ancestry that are slaves for life. 
And over the course of time, this concept gets deeply embedded into how we, as Americans, view conditions of labor. Increasingly, blackness was associated with um, perpetual, infinite labor, infinite subservience. Uh, you answered to your quote-unquote master. The conditions of white labor were much, much different. Even if they were very bad, even if you came over as, you know, a poor, no money to my name, indentured servant, it was at least possible on paper to change that, that eventually you could graduate from indentureship, uh, scrape together some land, and things could be and sometimes were very different. Um, this is going to establish at least one element of what you might call white supremacy on the North American continent. It's through labor that we see this concept of white supremacy implemented, right? Because black labor was to be subservient to white, uh, it was economic in its orientation, but it's going to establish white supremacy, and this is going to trickle down into pretty much every realm of American life, whether that's economic or otherwise. And as you also might imagine, this is also going to lead to some social discontent. Uh, keep in mind, guys, that one of the things that had been established um, pretty early on in this process is the free-flowing of English labor from the old world to the new world. Well, if you think about this, this is pretty much, you know, a cost-benefit sort of analysis. And why would you pay for indentured white labor and have to re-recruit it every four to seven years when you could purchase somebody off of a boat and, and they're now a slave for life? After 1640, this is becoming a realistic possibility in places like Virginia as well as Maryland. Um, I guess maybe what I am trying to say here is that this is putting some white indentures out of work, if you will. I'm not saying that this was a great life or lifestyle, but certainly this, this, this made an impact. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's in this context that I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Nathaniel Bacon. Bacon is one of these um, um, former indentured servants that is going to be negatively affected by the use of black labor uh, in, in, in places like Virginia. And Bacon knows what's happening to him. He, he understands that what he really needs at the end of the day is land. He needs access to land. And so he goes to the, the, the governor of the Virginia colony. Uh, it had expanded beyond Jamestown at that point. But he goes to the governor, a guy by the name of uh, William Berkeley, and he says, let's take the colonial militia right down the road. There's a collection of Native Americans. We conquer them, take their land, and we could dole it out to people like me who desperately need land. Berkeley says no. <laughs> no, no, just a, a, an unequivocal no. Part of the reason for this is Berkeley was entirely corrupt, and the people that were corrupting him were rich, large landowners that didn't want to compete with the Bacons of the world. They liked having a monopoly on the land, and they liked having people like Bacon and pretty much everybody else at their beck and call underneath them socially, politically, and economically. And so it was not for no good reason that the, that the governor said no. Um, Bacon is not a guy that hears no very well. Um, what he does is he takes matters into his own hands. He, he gets together with other landless former indentureds, just like himself, and they go conquer these Native Americans on their own. And it's at that point that Berkeley does dispatch the militia to arrest Bacon. They arrest him, they throw him in jail, and this touches off a massive, massive rioting spree that comes to be known as Bacon's Rebellion. It's the people that fought alongside Nathaniel Bacon that will comprise what comes to be called Bacon's Rebellion. And in 1676, what these people do is burn down huge chunks of Virginia. Um, they spring Bacon out of jail. He wouldn't live much longer than that, but eventually things are able to calm down. And when they calm down, there are reforms that are put into place. Um, part of these reforms are aimed at appeasing the landless white workers like Bacon. Uh, things like low taxes, 
um, things like the ability in, in some ways, shapes, and forms to participate either directly or indirectly in what you might call the political process. But more than anything else, what they established was white supremacy as it related to even landless, working class, relatively impoverished white people like Nathaniel Bacon. That even the, the, the most educated, most refined African-American man would be at a notch or two lower than, than, than the most impoverished, uh, ignorant of white people, Bacon included, but certainly not limited to. In other words, this white supremacy that we were talking about in the context of John Punch, it's trickling down to social relations as well. And people of the working class white variety are beginning to buy into this concept of white supremacy. And certainly you can see that in the life and times of people like Frederick Douglass um, that sees it showing up pretty, pretty clearly in places like Mobile, New Orleans and Charleston. Uh, working class whites there are not very big fans of slavery, primarily because they know that slavery, if, uh, if these crafts, if you will, uh, uh, artisans, uh, blacksmiths, people of that variety, uh, if, if that, the, those arts or trades are taught to the slaves, it's going to put them out of business. Um, it's also going to make them some of the fiercest defenders of slavery in the sense that this was the established social order. Um, you might not be very much as Nathaniel Bacon, uh, but at least you're not a slave. And so you can see that this colonization of the English North American Empire is a very, uh, what am I trying to say here? It's a very uh, complicated endeavor. It is uh, complicated in a lot of ways uh, that you've got a lot of moving parts to it. Now, again, I don't expect you to break your hands writing this down. If you want to put it on pause and have it in your notes, certainly you're welcome to this, or you can simply download it uh, when you have an opportunity. In any case, I want you to understand, as we conclude, that the English North American model uh, was different than the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, or any other group that we've talked about primarily because they're producing an agricultural cash crop and selling it in the old world. Um, it's based on the, the accessibility of cheap labor. First, cheap impoverished labor from England and eventually captive labor, labor that had been bought and sold in Africa and, and transported to the New World. Um, and the last thing that I want to mention is that this is not going to be the last time that we talk about English colonization of the New World. Uh, the next time we meet, we are going to talk about a group of people that are going to colonize the region approximately 500 miles north uh, of what, what is Virginia. And that's what we call the New England colonies. You're going to see that the people that are going to come to populate the New England colonies have a very different purpose and certainly a very different attitude in terms of what their colonial world would and should look like. And that's where we'll pick it up in the next lecture.